Bonjour tout le monde, bienvenue au... Good afternoon everyone and welcome to IDRC. I'd like to welcome our visitors as well. This International Development Research Center, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this first event of IDRC's Science and Innovation Lecture Series. Uh, this series is going to showcase leading thinkers from both developing and developed countries uh, working on science, technology, and innovation issues, and on the public policy issues that arise from them. This inaugural event focuses on media piracy in developing countries, in emerging economies. The debate about how to foster innovation and promote access to knowledge rages in a world where it is now possible to infinitely reproduce a digital good at almost no marginal cost. On the one hand, we have the view expressed by Cardiff University professor Ian Hargraves in his review of intellectual property and growth. Uh, commissioned by the British Prime Minister, which found that copyright law has started to act as a barrier to the creation of new, innovative businesses. Uh, Professor Hargraves points out that the laws were largely written before the emergence of digital technologies. But not everyone agrees with that point of view. Just last week, a group of 28 United States senators wrote to President Obama, urging his administration to include the highest level of intellectual property protections in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, the stakes are high in a world of intellectual property, innovation, and trade. Piracy, for example, is rampant in emergency, emerging economies, leading to millions or billions in lost sales, according to industry lobby groups. The International Federation of the Phonographic Industry estimates that 40 billion songs were illegally file-shared in 2008. The software industry missed out on more than $51 billion in profits last year as a result of software piracy, a recent study shows. But there are also many questions. How reliable are these figures? What are the underlying causes of media piracy? Are legal and economic remedies appropriate and adequate? Are enforcement measures stifling social and technological innovation? It's with that sort of question in mind that IDRC, along with the Ford Foundation and the Canadian International Development Agency, funded the first independent, large-scale study of music, film, and software piracy in emerging economies, with a focus on Brazil, India, Russia, South Africa, Mexico, and Bolivia. We're here to discuss the groundbreaking results of that report. We're fortunate to have amongst us Joe Karaganis uh, from the Social Science Research Council. Joe oversaw uh, the running of this study. Ronaldo Lemos, a uh, visiting uh, fellow at Princeton University, is also here with us virtually. He's in Princeton. He couldn't get a visa in time to come to Canada. Uh, and he'll give us a specific perspective from Brazil. Ronaldo's institution was principally responsible for the research work in Brazil. And finally, uh, we have uh, Professor Michael Geis, Canada Research Chair for Internet and E-Commerce Law at the University of Ottawa. Uh, he's agreed to join us to discuss how these issues relate to Canada. Your moderator for this event will be my colleague Laurent Elder, the, idea, the program leader for IDRC's new program leading with these issues. Nos conférenciers vont uh, prononcer la our speakers will speak English, but you have simultaneous interpretation services that are offered. You can use them. Devices are available at the back of the room to your right. If you wish to ask questions or make comments in French or in English, it is up to you. We, it will be our pleasure to answer in the language of your choice. Laurent will be able to translate for you. Uh, conference and the subsequent debate is going to be webcast. So if you do choose to stand up behind one of the two microphones at the back of the room and ask a question, you will get your Warholy in 15 minutes of fame. Your voice and face will be flashed around the internet and you'll be known worldwide. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for coming. Laurent, over to you.
Thanks. So here's how the, um, the whole session will happen. Uh, we'll have about an hour's presentation from first Joe, who's going to give you an overview of the study, followed by Ronaldo Lemos, who hopefully on the screen will be able to give us a, a view from Brazil, basically what does this issue mean from the point of view of Brazil. And then we'll have Michael, who will give us the point of view from Canada. What do issues of piracy mean in the context of Canada? That'll be followed by, as Lachlan said, about 30 minutes or a bit more of questions from you, the audience, as well as uh, online. So before moving to uh, Joe's presentation, so this is the book, and I thought I'd read to you some of the reviews that it's had. It's had some pretty incredible uh, reviews. Gilberto, Gilberto Gil, who of course is uh, the famous musician, Brazilian musician, but also the ex-minister of culture of Brazil, said that this remarkable study should be required reading for anyone concerned with copyright and enforcement or with the challenges of cultural globalization. Uh, William Patry, the, the chief counsel at Copyright Council at Google, also said that the Social Science Research Council study is a landmark in the copyright literature, an actual empirical investigation into what works and what doesn't in the enforcement arena. If policymakers want to guide, want to be guided by evidence and not rhetoric, they will begin with the council study and stay with it for a very long time. Finally, Felix Salmon of Reuters um, said, this is massive and wonderful, an astonishing work of cooperative international scholarship and really ought to fundamentally change the debate about intellectual property enforcement in arenas with names like WIPO and the USTR. But I fear that it's too sensible and empirical for that. So a few words about Joe. Uh, Joe Karaganis is the Vice President of the American Assembly, and he also directs the Social Science Research Council projects on media, technology, and culture, uh, including the Necessary Knowledge for a Democratic Public Sphere Program and the Culture, Creativity, and Information Technology Program. So Joe, over to you. Thank you very much. So I'll apologize in advance for any uh, bouts of coughing that may interrupt. <laughs> I'm struggling with a bit of a cold, but I'll, I'll try and keep those to a minimum. Uh, really, very briefly today, I just want to run through some of the, the, the major points of the research and tell you a bit about the conditions uh, that, that, that led to it, some of the reasons we, under, we undertook it, and uh, then be happy to address any questions you might have in, in comments. Really, I'm just going to breeze through some of the highlights of the report. But to begin, I wanted to take you back to 2006 when some of our conversations uh, began that, that, that led to the, both the, the planning and then the conducting of the report, of the research. And as Laughlin said, uh, you know, the, the discourse around piracy, around copyright infringement, uh, has really been built around industry claims of losses, often in the tens of billions of dollars. Uh, when we started looking at some of the industry literature on copyright infringement in developing countries especially, uh, claimed rates of 70%, 80%, 90% of the markets for software, film, uh, music, other kinds of uh, copyrighted goods, uh, rates of those, those extremely high rates of piracy were the norm. Uh, rates of digital music piracy were said to be even higher, 95%. Uh, when we looked at those numbers, you know, we came from it, uh, we, we decided to adopt a somewhat different perspective. I mean, when, we, when we looked at those numbers, we said, well, that's, you know, that's, that's not a drain on the media economy per se. That is the media economy. And most of that media economy is an illicit economy. Most of the access to media goods in most parts of the world uh, passes through illicit channels. And we saw really no discussion of this relationship between the licit and illicit markets in these countries. No discussion in the industry literature, no discussion in policy debates, or for that matter in the academic literature. There was very little academic work on piracy when we began this work. And it seemed important to us, if you're concerned about addressing the, the, the problem of 
uh, illicit markets, illicit markets for media goods, to really understand how that relationship between the illicit and the illicit is constructed. And by the same token, in the last 10 years, there's been a massive growth of uh, enforcement efforts, especially as the digital transition has made uh, digital piracy much more accessible to people with uh, an, an increasingly low-end equipment, as the explosion of, of, of copying and of, of, of file sharing has really shifted the pirate economy into something that's organized primarily at the consumer level rather than the industrial level. Uh, this has been accompanied by massive private and public investment in enforcement and the, uh, the growth of new layers of, of bureaucracy and policing to, to uh, conduct that enforcement. Uh, new policy venues that, that adopt intellectual property enforcement as their primary function. Uh, new industry research and, and, and research organizations that have, that have uh, been devoted to producing the evidentiary discourse that feeds these policy conversations. And uh, perhaps most importantly, an effort to shift the burden of enforcement from the private to the public sector. Because traditionally intellectual property uh, was, is, is a private right. Uh, most of the enforcement has been conducted through uh, civil, uh, uh, civil actions. And there was really a, a, a fairly narrow range of activities that crossed the threshold into criminal behavior and therefore that would become the responsibility of public organizations. Uh, that boundary has been eroded over the last 10 years, in some cases completely torn down. So there's been this very fundamental shift, not only in uh, you know, how much enforcement there is and how many, how many resources are devoted to it, but really the range of things that are subject to, to enforcement, especially through criminal law. And we saw virtually no work on the subject. So we began to put together a comparative study of media piracy that mirrored in some respects the industry reports, but that tried to ask a broader set of questions. First, how is piracy organized, just as a practical matter? How is it conducted? Uh, second, what are its costs, but also its benefits? Since the question of trying to uh, approach piracy or address policy, piracy as a policy matter really has to pass through some account of why it persists, why it's so popular, why it's, why it, why it's so resistant to enforcement efforts. Uh, third, how is enforcement organized from the street level to international policy making? And then fourth, what do we know about piracy and how do we know it? Who's producing the knowledge? Who's doing the research? How reliable is that research? And because we were interested primarily in developing countries, this work focuses heavily on a, te a, a technological transition, a transition from a media economy based mostly on optical discs, CDs and then DVDs, or I should say CDs, VCDs and then DVDs, uh, to uh, what in high income countries is now an almost entirely digital uh, internet based infrastructure for, for file sharing for, for both licit and illicit uh, media consumption. So in the developing countries we were looking at, and this is uh, India, Brazil, South Africa, Russia, um, Mexico and Bolivia, this transition is, is still underway. Right? Rates of adoption of broadband are skyrocketing, but skyrocketing from an incredibly low level. So between 2006 and 2011, you have uh, numbers that go from, you know, in, in the single digits to rates of adoption of 20 percent, 30 percent, in some cases higher. And that is, that's on a, that, that's creating a, an arc or a, a transition from the optical disk era to the pure digital era in a much more compressed time frame than we saw in the US, Europe, Canada, Japan over the last 10 years. So the result uh, involved about 35 researchers working on this for about three years of, act of research and then uh, you know, additional time writing and, and editing and doing all the other things. You know, this, is, this is essentially our table of contents. Uh, the results, uh, as uh, Laurent was kind enough to point out, I think have been recognized as a, as a very important contribution uh, well, to the copyright literature first and foremost because empirical investigations of what copyright means in practice as opposed to what it means in, on the books or in, uh, are, are relatively rare. It's, it's, there are a variety of uh, incentive problems around getting academics to both collaborate internationally, which is challenging, uh, but also to uh, engage interdis in an interdisciplinary fashion with uh, people working on either policy issues or law issues, and, and one, of the, one of the real privileges of this work from my perspective, one of, one of the reasons it's been such a privilege to be involved with it, 
is that it's been able to mobilize these different resources, right? these different uh, people working, uh, both anth anthropologists, sociologists, uh, lawyers, uh, uh, technical uh, experts. I mean, there's, there's been a, a vast variety of expertise brought to bear on this work, and and the strength of the work is is really, I hope, in its ability to, in its ability to synthesize that in a way that tells a story that everybody knows a piece of, but has rarely been able to assemble into something that provides a, a a more general account of what's happening, of, of what the digital transition means, especially in developing countries. So Laurent read a few of uh, the, the more favorable reviews. I think one, one of my favorites is the <laughs> is the you know the feedback we've gotten f fairly frequently when I present this. That's the, that the report is obvious. Right? It's, what, it's, what it's saying is obvious if you're familiar with the dyna dynamics around digital piracy, around digital media access. And I find that very gratifying, to be honest, because uh, this is a policy debate that has studiously avoided the obvious. And I'll tell you what the, you know, if, if you don't know what the obvious is yet, I'll tell you in, a, in just a second. But, uh, you know, in a sense, we are, you know, this, this is, the, the debate around copyright and piracy has uh, avoided looking at the question of access to media, at, at questions of pricing, at questions of just how, you know, What's, uh, of, of where the technologies are going. So uh, I doubt there's anybody in this audience that thinks that it's going to get harder or more expensive to copy a digital file in the next 10 years. It's going, only, only going to get easier. The technologies involved are only going to get more pervasive. Uh, you know, if you take that as your baseline, what do you think is going to change? If you're concerned about piracy as a, as a, as a, as a policy issue, as a moral issue, what do you think is going to change? And that's a question that we've tried to address in looking at some of these dynamics in developing countries where the fundamental problem, as we describe it at least, is a price problem. Where media markets are extremely high priced relative to local incomes. As a consequence, they're very underdeveloped. There are very few means of, of, of gaining access legally to software, to, uh, to recorded music, to film. And consequently, pirated access has provided over, over you know, the, the most uh, popular means of, of uh, just very simply gaining access to the music and film and software that people are exposed to relentlessly through these enormously successful global advertising campaigns. So one way of looking at the report is that it's, it's, it's tracing the, the, the complete triumph of advertising and of the generation of, 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 a, of a truly global culture for movies, uh, music and, and software without any corresponding democratization of access to those goods for most of the world's population. The, the, the difference between those two things is piracy, just very simply. And it, uh, enforcement really is just what happens around the edges of that relationship. And we've looked at enforcement from, lot, uh, from lots of directions, can identify places where uh, enforcement plays a, you know, a, essentially a game of whack-a-mole where uh, you know, one type of enforcement becomes prominent. They stomp on it with the with the hammer. Something else comes up. Stomp on that, you know, and, and the game goes on as the technologies evolve, as the consumer practices evolve. So, you know, part of the problem we've been looking at is well, how do you how do you end the game of whack-a-mole? Where does it end without the whole thing kind of shutting down or <laughs> blowing up? Or um, how do business models emerge that can address the next several billion media consumers? How do business models emerge at the low end of, the, of these media markets? And the problem is that the existing models have, have not just failed to do that, but have demonstrated no particular interest in doing that for reasons that I'll get into. So today I want to talk briefly about two things, uh, the organization of piracy and the organization of enforcement. And as I said, the organization of piracy for us means above all in relation, in its relation to licit markets. And what does that mean? Well, we, we try to look at media markets from the side of consumer demand, not just legal supply, and see piracy and legal media, media as part of what is, from the consumer perspective, a continuous spectrum of availability at different levels of affordability and convenience. Second, we look at the actual distribution architecture and, and infrastructure on the ground, as opposed to a kind of wishful notion that everybody in principle could buy the good legally if they chose to. There are lots of ways in which the market is distorted so that 
you know, even if you were even if you were interested in purchasing something legally in, in Brazil or India, often it's not available at all. Uh, and third, we looked at price factors, and and, and just to reiter reiterate the pricing issue because it, it's really the, the the main takeaway, and as I said, the obvious takeaway. Uh, we drew two conclusions. One, one is that high prices and low incomes yield tiny licit markets. I know that's a shocker. Uh, and second, that high prices, low incomes, and cheap digital technologies yield ubiquitous piracy. So I'll come back to those in more detail. The, the second thing I want to talk a bit about briefly is the organization of enforcement, and here in regard to three sort of sub-issues. One uh, is claims that organized crime is the principal driver of media piracy, or that the, that organized crime and terrorist groups are funded by media piracy. Uh, the second is the case of business software, and reasons why we should treat business software as a very different type of market than markets for film or, or, or music. And third, the question of what happens when scarce enforcement resources confront ubiquitous piracy. In other words, why why enforcement has such a hard time scaling? scaling to, to address the, the scale of the practice. So to begin, I, I, I want to talk a bit about this pricing question. It's, it's provided a very useful window onto some of the media market and market structure issues that, that we've focused on. Now, this sort of chart won't be news to many of you. It's just a, a, a GDP per capita for the countries that we were looking at. And, uh, you know, the the important thing that this chart is suggesting is that, the, that you know, between India and the U.S., there's a, there's, a, there's a very wide range of income that in the media markets is mapped onto a very narrow range of pricing. So you get huge income disparities that, that, that uh, uh, you know, in, in which most of the population simply cannot afford the prices at which media are offered. So if you look at the markets themselves, you look at, if you st it simply make some observations of, of, of price, both in the legal markets and, and, and illegal markets, the first thing you notice is that the price for CDs or DVDs or software is almost always Western pricing. There's very little price discrimination in developing markets. And anywhere you do have significant variations in pricing, then you have something to explain. I mean, the, 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 the industry behavior that we've observed in country after country is that they maintain Western pricing whenever possible. And there are a variety of conditions under which they can get forced or, or pressured or, or the incentives become sufficiently interesting so that you get exceptions to that rule. And the exceptions are where things get interesting. The exceptions are where you have to, have to start explaining what's going on in the, in the local market. So this is a scene from 2008. It's the release of The Dark Knight in Beijing. The Dark Knight became kind of a, one of our iconic uh, objects of study because it was uh, both the most a profitable movie of 2008 when we began our work, and also the most pirated. So it made over a billion dollars, was far and away the most pirated film of 2008. And if you look, if you look at how the DVD was priced when it was released that same year, well, you, know, you note a couple things. The column on the left is the legal price in U.S. dollars uh, at the time of its initial release. I'll, I'll, run, I'll run you through this chart. Is the chart legible from where you are? The lights are a bit bright for this. Can people see it? Okay. Okay, so the <clears throat> this is the, the legal price. And what you notice is that there's about a $14 or $15 uh, floor on pricing. That, that's, um, prices can go up from there, but they rarely, go, they, they rarely drop below it. And that largely reflects the control of a handful of Hollywood studios on the theatrical market that can dictate terms to, to distributors. Uh, you know, uniform pricing is strongest in the DVD and software markets. It's weaker in the theatrical and CD markets. But basically, uh, you know, you, you, what, what you're seeing here is a uh, is the 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 power of uh, you know the, essentially the cartel behavior of the Hollywood studios around DVD pricing. And if you're trying to understand what that means in terms of local incomes, we we created something we call the comparative purchasing power index, which is a translation of those local prices into their, their relative prices in sort of U.S. terms. So the CPP price is the price that the good would cost for an American if it cost 
an equivalent share of GDP, GDP per capita. So it's just a way of, of, of indicating what, what the relative price of the good would be if it were priced at, the, at, at comparable levels in the U.S. And what you see from that is that the prices are just crazily high. Uh, and that, you know, this is, this is just a way of indicating that DVD markets in most parts of the world are luxury markets. They're not mass markets. You can do the same exercise if you're looking at prices in the pirate markets. So here we, we found, uh, you know, typical pirate market prices, and I'll, I'll begin by qualifying this. This is, it's challenging to come up with uh, reliable pricing for goods in pirated markets. Uh, they vary for a lot of reasons. In fact, all these numbers are subject to a lot of variation if you're looking at things like uh, fluctuating exchange rates or uh, you know, the way uh, the declines in the price of a DVD over time as it, as, as it shifts from sort of top billing to uh, older, less, um, you know, less, less, um, you know, sort of back catalog material. Those, those, they're, they're, they're falls in pricing over time. But this is, these are good approximations of the, of the price of the pirated good in these markets. And what you see, first of all, is that the pirated, you know, the, the pirated good is effectively the mass market price. You know, what, what the, the price of the pirated good is in the same ballpark as the legal price in, uh, in the high-income countries, and you know what it, what it means is that as, as, as you know, it's just a reflection of, of the mass market operating primarily through the pirate market in these countries. The, par the, the pirate market is the mass market. The legal market is serving a tiny fraction of the population. The pirate market is serving a much larger share of the population. And there's both a supply and a demand dimension to this. One of the things we looked at was the explosion of DVD players in the, in the 2000s. So one of the things that happened between, in nine, between 2000 and 2007 is that the Chinese started cranking out DVD players at an astonishing rate. Millions upon millions of them were exported. The price of them fell from $200 to $20. So that you know, within the sp span of a couple years, you had adoption rates in South Africa or India or Brazil going from 0 to 50 60% of households. Suddenly, DVD players are a ubiquitous item, and the price the, the, the price of the DVDs, in contrast, is still at 14 or $15. Well, what happens? You have a massive infrastructure that, that emerges very quickly and no development of the legal supply at prices that people can afford. The same is true of burners. So burner, DVD burners become commodity priced items. Suddenly, people can start supplying their own. And you have the emergence of very cheap production, very localized production, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the provision of a mass market of pirated DVDs to meet the to, to supply this infrastructure that people suddenly have often the first time they've they've had access to recorded media of any kind. The other factor I'll just point to is the collapse in pricing. So between the U.S. and Russia at five dollars and the roughly dollar or so uh, that a D, the pirated DVD costs in India and Mexico that that's a, that's a pricing arc. Uh, between between 2000 and 2008, or, or, or 2009, you know, the, t 10 years ago, the prices of, in any of these countries would have been about $5 for a DVD. Now, in competitive pirate markets, prices under a dollar. That's another way of looking at this explosion of production and co uh, productive capacity of, for, for, for cheap copies and the infrastructure that it serves. Prices have collapsed when the pirate market is a competitive market. Now, in the U.S., it's still $5, basically, because there's no more physical DVD market anymore to speak of. It's all moved online. If you want a pirated copy of a new movie, you don't look for the pirated DVD. You just download it online. And that's true in virtually all the developed countries. Uh, in India and Mexico, it's still a mass market for, for pirated DVDs. Some of the interesting variations between those numbers, between a dollar and five dollars, are really where you start looking at interesting kind of local effects of enforcement or uh, differences in, in the cost of the, of the, of the raw materials. Or things like collusion between vendors, where uh, there, are, there are cases where vendors organize to prop up prices, organized criminal gr groups intervene to prop up prices. Uh, the Russian case is a special one. Our Russia team was somewhat dismayed to learn that the, the price of parted goods in Russia was the highest in our study other than the U.S. Uh, that's largely a function of state control of the pirate market, where, uh, you know, <laughs> where uh, you know, a funny thing happened in 2006, 2007, when the Russian government uh, 
you know, partly at the behest of the U.S. and in, in the context of its effort to join the WTO, agreed to a massive crackdown on pirated goods, massive uh, expansion of police activity and raids that swept out all the lower tier producers and distributors, but left the, the large scale industrial pirates who generally benefited from police or state protection and so were sheltered from this, this huge increase in raids. So it was those lower tiers, <coughs> it was those lower tiers of producers that were really driving the, the collapse in prices. Take, take those people out and the remaining large scale pirate cartels can, can exercise some control over pricing. So that's really the dynamic we were looking at in Russia. And that's, that, you know, that's, that's one of many local variations on this issue that, that you know, we spent so much time documenting in the report and that is, you know, was really what was so challenging and rich about, uh, you know, about being able to mobilize so many researchers in so many different contexts, right? Because you can, you can talk about the global level at which these events are, which these technologies matter and the ways in which cultural practices are, are following a kind of global adoption of technologies. But then when you look locally, there's lots of variation. And the variation matters when you're talking about access to, access to knowledge, access to media, policy strategies for encouraging those things. So that's, you know, the, the country studies are really where the heart of the work lies. Uh, you can t tell a similar story about domestically produced films. Uh, we, we'd sort of begun with the hypothesis that domestic producers would be more interested in producing movies for local audiences at lower prices. Now that turns out, for the most part, not to be true. Now, if you're looking at the top tier productions in uh, most of the countries that interested us, they're already part of a global system of, of movie investment and distribution. They're already part of effectively global Hollywood, and they take their pricing cues from those uh, you know, from those models. They're all they're all priced at you know levels that are equivalent to whatever the, the you know the current Hollywood hits are. The exceptions to this rule, and the, the exceptions turned out to be very important to us, are really uh, India primarily, and then Nigeria. When we we spent less time looking at Nigeria, but India is the primary case where uh, in the Indian market, the thing that, the, the thing that differentiates the Indian market from all the other markets we looked at is that it's overwhelmingly dominated by domestic companies. You know, the, the companies competing for the Indian movie, movie audience uh, are Indian companies. And what happens in a context where you have domestic competition for audiences is that they compete like crazy for each <laughs> to expand those audiences, uh, to expand into much wider uh, segments of the population than you see in Brazil and South Africa and in Russia, where the, the, the movie market is essentially uh, Hollywood plus a handful of local independent film producers. In the Indian market, it's 94% Indian, uh, basically the reverse of the usual ratio. So you have Indian companies that come in and, and start, uh, you know, be, because they're so, they're, I mean, the, the, this is a somewhat more complicated story, but the, 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 the briefest version is that. The Indians come in, they, they decide, well, there's, there's no home video market here to speak of. We might as well uh, create a mass market, price things at 2 to $3, compete with the high end of the pirate market. That's, that's something that's really happened in the last couple of years. And for us, it's a very interesting analog to the emergence of disruptive digital distribution models in the high income countries. If you're looking at companies like Netflix or Spotify or Hulu, uh, these are the companies that are radically reshaping pricing and access on the basis of a digital media infrastructure and uh, you know, creating very different pricing structures for those goods, the Indians are doing this through the DVD market where the, you know, the, the, the internet infrastructure is not yet there to support this kind of revolution in distribution. But uh, it's not necessary. What you, the important thing is not a digital infrastructure. The important, in, the important thing is competition, local competition for audiences. And that, for us, was revelatory. It meant that we weren't talking primarily about intellectual property policy as kind of a gatekeeper for media access, but rather about market competition and market structure. And where you see companies that are genuinely interested in competing for, for local audiences, prices, prices fall because the costs of production have fallen. Uh, where you see prices that are essentially Western level in South Africa or, in, or, or Brazil or Russia, it's because there, there are, the companies in those markets are not interested in competing for local audiences. Now, 
I'll skip through the, the version of this story I could tell with respect to Coldplay. I mean, the similar in the, in the record industry. But you know, we spent a long time trying to understand whether this was rational behavior. All right, are these industries acting rationally? And we concluded that they are. This is not, uh, um, this is not reluctance to take advantage of an otherwise glowing market opportunity. This is a rational strategy for how you manage a global market. If you're a global company trying to structure prices across a global market, so what are the things that matter to you if you're a major record company uh, trying to protect record sales in a global marketplace? Well, the, the markets that you want to, that you care about, the markets that you want to protect are the high income developed markets, the US, the UK, Japan. The developing country markets, for the most part, don't even signify. I mean, bar they barely show up on these charts, right? So, you know, what, what's the advantage of, run, of trying to structure a market around local prices where you have to develop separate infrastructures for pricing things at, a, at, at much lower levels? Uh, you know, we, how those calculations happen within these companies is not something we get into. Their observed behavior, however, is that they don't do it. Another way of looking at this is in countries with high degrees of income inequality, lowering the price doesn't get you that much more audience. So it's not the case that if you cut the price in half, you'll get twice the audience. You may only get 20% more audience. Profit, maximize, profit maximizing behavior in countries with high degrees of income quality will often dictate a very high price and the resulting very small market. Well, that's fine. That's rational, but it's not a, pub it's not a good public policy outcome if you're in the Ministry of Culture in Brazil or in, the, in, its, uh, in, a, in a, a similar position in Russia or South Africa. Uh, this is the same story with respect to box office. I mean, which, which are the box offices that matter here? It's the U.S., Canada. Uh, the green line is India, incidentally, which has, which has a, huge music, uh, a huge movie business that uh, is built around mass audiences and prices that are a fraction of, those, uh, of most of the, the Hollywood-dominated film markets. And it turns out that uh, this pricing stuff is very powerful once people start appreciating it. And of course, the, you know, the first thing that people know about their, the media market in which they live is how much things cost. But they don't often know how much things cost for other people. And they don't often have a good explanation for why they cost what they cost. So we've found that as the, as the report circulates and begins to sort of find its audiences, this pricing question rises to the top very quickly. People are very interested in the fact that, that in an era in which everybody appreciates that the production and distribution of these goods no longer costs anything, really, uh, that prices remain high. Prices remain pegged to uh, the prices in countries that have much higher levels of income. And these are, these are simply, these are, these are market strategies. These are no longer necessities. And that becomes a very powerful lever for uh, changing how people understand their relationship, not just to the market, but to the, to the, to the policies and laws that govern those markets. So I will uh, cruise through these questions on the organization of enforcement just in the interest of time. How, how much time? Are, to five minutes, I think? OK. So uh, a couple words on business software. Business software, in our view, needs to be considered a completely separate market. Right? This is a fairly standard industry comp comment. Uh, so software piracy is rampant in South Africa. Uh, South Africa has actually the lowest rate of software piracy of any African country, lower than many European countries, among the lowest of developing countries. It's a model of uh, compliance with software licenses in, de in the developing world. If you look sort of up, higher up the chain of command, you begin to get statements that are much more cognizant of the benefits of network effects, of widespread adoption of your software. So in fact, there's a, there's a real disconnect between the enforcement guys in the software business and the, and the corporate side of things, where if you're a, comp if you're a company that's, interested, that's either a, mono a monopoly in a market or trying to enter a market, the most important thing you can do is ensure that lots of people are using your software. That's the most valuable asset. Right? And piracy, <coughs> excuse me, in a market that you're not choosing to serve at prices that people can afford, how do you do that? You'd have, you, you, tolerate a very high level of piracy. So when you see 90% rates of software piracy in China or 80% rates of pir software piracy in India, what you're looking at is a market that Microsoft or 
Adobe or uh, you know any number of other companies have, have successfully completely saturated with their products. And there, there's no there, there's no way you can overestimate the value of that. I mean, that's what they've done is effectively locked out comp competition, notably from open source competitors. I mean, who's going to adopt Linux in a market where you can get Windows for free? I mean, those have, those those turn into very complicated strategic choices made at the level of, of public institutions generally. And then the business model is quite simple. Now, this is another you know, another quote that's just sort of teasing out the development aspect of this. So, a lot, you know. Many of the leaders in these countries are aware that you know, for, to have a modern economy, you need a software infrastructure. How do you develop a software infrastructure when the f prices are totally unaffordable? You know, the piracy of these goods essentially creates the software infrastructure that enables a huge range of other kinds of, of business activity. But then what do the software companies do in that, uh, it, as a follow-up? Well, they, they start to go after the big institutions, and they enforce against the public agencies, the schools, the municipalities, the large corporations. And they cut volume licensing deals with those entities. So, you know, gradually they begin to recapture in uh, in, in, in legal form all the all you know, entities of any of sufficient size to be worth going at, uh, to be worth licensing to. And so there's a threshold where enforcement matters. Enforcement happens against the small businesses, the people who are just right at the edge of being worth bothering with. Uh, but the, 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 the real market is in volume licenses, and the volume licenses uh, are priced at whatever the, whatever the institution can afford. And you'll never, you'll never hear what that price is because those are subject to contractual secrecy clauses. And you know, so effectively the market that matters to the big software vendors is unpriced because they're cutting individual deals with institutions. And it's, it's just been enormously effective. I mean, the rates of growth in most of these markets is, is very high. I mean, uh, Steve Ballmer was complaining last week about 80% rates of piracy in China and how much they were, how many billions they were losing. Microsoft wouldn't, at the end of the day, they wouldn't want it any other way. To to, to begin to enforce Microsoft licenses in China is just to create a, a, a you know the conditions for mass adoption of open source alternatives. There's no way they'd want to do that, even if they could, and they could do they could to some extent. I mean, the, the other thing that's that, that's relevant here is that. There are technical measures through which most of these companies could enforce their licenses. They could make it very difficult to run a pirated copy of Windows. They elect not to because of the value of the network effects. So our view is that the, the, you know, the, the software people have no problems, really. There's the, the, the claims of software losses have driven the debate. They should just be essentially ignored unless they can make a more compelling case about why uh, the value of the, 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 why the sales that they're losing at the margin to piracy are more valuable than the network effects that they, that they benefit from through widespread adoption of their software. Raid-based enforcement, I'll be very quick about this. This is the whole story in a nutshell. It's relatively easy to scale up the number of raids because you can pay the police to conduct them. You can get you know, compliant governments to fund special units for anti-piracy activity. Due process, on the other hand, is slow and expensive. Uh, None of the court systems that we were looking at have the time or energy to do it. These are the kinds of ratios you get uh, where you just have very high levels of raids, very low levels of actual uh, prosecution or convictions. Most of those end up being suspended sentences. Uh, and as a result, the raid becomes the punishment. I mean, the, the, the enforcement process becomes extra, jur extra juridical in the sense that it's not destined toward resolution in court. It's not it's not headed toward a process in which there will be an argument about guilt or innocence and an opportunity for redress if, it's a, if, if, the, if the charge is false. It's just about seizing equipment, seizing goods, disrupting activity. I mean, all, the, the, the punishment phase and the raid have become the same thing, in effect. And that's a real problem because it goes to the, the heart of the enforcement question, which is that it's very difficult to scale up enforcement. There's no way to scale up the accompanying due process. Right? So that, you know, the, the way this plays out on the streets of, one, of you know, Buenos Aires or, or Delhi is in the, in the form of police raids. The way it's playing out in Canada or the U.S. or France is in this debate about what happens with Internet disconnection, right? For people who are accused of multiple infringements and who are increasingly threatened with Internet disconnection, how does due process work for those people? What, what's, what's their ability to seek redress in the event that the charge is false or in the event that they're not the person on the end of that IP address who's been uh, downloading that movie or that song? There's been, no, there's been no good answer to this question, and it's really why all the three strikes initiatives, the three 
when I say three strikes, you, you know what I'm talking about. This is these are law. Generally, they're generally they're they're laws that dictate that if you are accused of an, of an infringing act, you'll be warned twice before the third strike, and then your service will be cut off. But there's been no test of this. There's been uh, and you know all the laws that are that have been put in place are really stalled at this question of implementation, right? Because there are lots of you know there are uh, you know, problems at every level, really, uh, beginning with the fact that single accounts often service multiple users. So cutting off service is a form of collective punishment. You can't really identify the person on the other end of that infringing act. Um, I, I won't go on. There, There's lots more there. This is a fairly typical ratio of raids to, uh, to convictions. And if you're asking why... Uh, Due process is so difficult to implement in these countries. Well, the court systems are overwhelmed with other kind of, with other more important activities, right? I mean, most of the court systems we're looking at really can't process even even the violent crimes that that take place in their communities. Uh, diverting resources to go after street level copyright infringement is just not a high priority for any of the, for any of the judges or, or even prosecutors, unless they've been specifically tasked with it, or if their if their if their budgets depend on their ability to. Uh, process copyright infringement conviction uh, cases. Uh, we find no systematic connections to any of the hard forms of organized crime. Uh, this is a rhetoric that has kind of flowered in the last few years as, as, as the industry tries to ramp up the level of sort of harms and illegality that are associated with copyright infringement. And it's for most of the reasons that I've just described. Uh, infringement is increasingly a consumer-driven activity. Prices have collapsed. Criminals have to compete with free now. When they didn't have to compete with free and could set their own prices, and DVD copying was an industrial scale activity that relied on you know, trans cross, cross border smuggling and a whole sort of international economy of smuggling. Organized criminal groups c clearly had a leg in that business. Uh, there's very little evidence that they play any systematic role in the increasingly consumer driven file sharing economy. It's not to say you can't find groups operating in niche markets. And the examples that tend to come up over and over again in the press are generally pointing to niches. They tend to get overrepresented as sort of the whole story. But in fact, uh, it's it's you know, it, it's a mistake to treat the organized criminal question as something that's relevant to how policy should be set with regard to copyright infringement because it's just a it's just a a side story at this point. It doesn't really matter. So just to say a note about the end game. Uh, you know, one of the, the other things that's, that's notable in this debate is the lack of a, a clearly defined end game for enforcement. Uh, how, you know, where do we end up 10 years from now? Uh, you know, the enforcement strategies tend to fail up in that uh, when they don't demonstrate any results, the conclusion is always that they're insufficiently severe or insufficiently uh, pervasive. And so every enforcement failure uh, tends to generate the next more sort of more intrusive law, and we're beginning to see this in the internet space now. The other side of it, if you're looking for uh, sort of accounts among the, the the rights holder groups about what the future should be, it almost always falls back on education. Right? Somehow we're going to educate the consumer out of this situation. Right? Um, there are lots of education efforts. I'm sure you encounter them all the time. Uh, you know, we we've see no evidence in our work or in any of the industry work for that matter because there's been some industry research on education efforts that these have had any effect. There's no demonstrable effect of any of them, right? Copyright, co file sharing is just not stigmatized at a level that would, that, that allows for any, uh, you know, plausible educational trajectory toward, you know, toward, toward language that all the international institutions have adopted, a culture of respect for, a culture of respect for intellectual property. Well, if, Where's the evidence that we're we're going to get there? All the, you know, everything points in the all the all the evidence about the prevalence of the practices point in the opposite direction. What we do see is a kind of a deal, whereby governments tend to be reluctant to increase punitive measures against file sharing, and businesses tend to be reluctant to talk about changes to business models, and so they agree that the consumer must be responsible. Right? Education becomes a kind of compromise position because it's something they can do together and work, and, and cooperate on. Now, I'll just end with a couple quotes. Uh, the first quote is, a, is an iconic quote at this point. Uh, Jack Valenti, who's one of the most colorful figures in this 
uh, area for, for decades, uh, comparing the original VCR to the Boston Strangler, how it's going to strangle the movie industry. And, you know, I mean, there, there are a variety of punchlines, right, that the home video market went on to be a much bigger market than the theatrical market and how the studios have resisted every new technology until it becomes a cash cow for them. But that's not really the one I want to focus on. That's not, that's not the story I want to focus on. I, I just want to suggest that the enforcement debate is still built around the Valenti view of these things, right? It's the hard line. It's you know, no unauthorized use should be permitted and that we have to adopt technical, technical means and legal means of controlling any, any form that unauthorized use might take. But there's another rhetoric that, uh, and another discourse that's emerging along the business model line Right, that you can see even in the even when you talk to people at the MPAA, where piracy is not seen as, as a kind of evil that must be excluded from the market, but as a sign of unmet demand, and that you know, I, I would venture that that's even becoming common sense at this point in the media business. That's, that barely constitutes a controversial comment, but it's one that is you know completely outside the boundaries of this conversation about enforcement. You know, we're still treating. The, the, the piracy question as if it's completely separate from the question of the structure of the illicit market. You know, the, the, the future is clearly for the illicit market to be treated as a, as, a, as a sign of unmet demand in the legal market and for the legal market to adjust. And you see that in, in lots of segments of, of, of the media market for these, for these types of goods. But it's, so far it's just had no impact on the policy space. So I want to leave you with that and, and certainly come back to questions about any of these things uh, in our follow-up time. Thank you. So now we get to see whether the technology will work for us. Can we get our, our Brazilian friend up? So we're quite fortunate today. We've actually got an NTV uh, star from Brazil. Um, and, and I'm speaking quite literally. Uh, Ronaldo Lemos actually hosts a show on, on the Brazilian uh, version of MTV, a weekly show on technology and culture. But of course, he's, he's much more than just a, a Brazilian MTV star. Um, he's right now a visiting fellow at uh, Princeton, and he is also the director of the Center for Technology and Society at uh, FGV, the, the School of Law in Rio. And he is also the director of the Creative Commons Brazil and former chairman of the board of iCommons. So Ronaldo will give us a, a deep dive into what this means from a Brazilian perspective. So Ronaldo, over to you. We can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Can yep. you hear me now? Yep, we got you. That's very good. Thank you very much, Lohan. I, I'm always uh, intrigued when someone introduces me like a, an MTV presenter especially because the MTV Brazil is very different from the MTV in the U.S., so I have to qualify that. Our show is pretty much a public interest show, so that's very important to mention. Uh, with that said, it's really a pleasure to be here participating in this event. Thank you, Vice President Lachlan, and thank you, Lohan. It's great to share this discussion with Michael and Joe. So I'll be focusing on the Brazilian side of our work. So basically, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what happened in Brazil and what's the current situation right now. So I would like to ask your permission. I'm going to switch for my slide presentation so you won't be able to see me uh, while I'm doing my presentation. So just one second. I just need confirmation that you can actually see my presentation now. Can you see my presentation? Yes. Yes. Well, I suppose you can. So basically, let's go with that. Like a, uh, so basically, my goal here is to talk to you a little bit about the media piracy in Brazil. And I would like to start by saying that the past decade in Brazil was basically the decade of enforcement. So basically, before that, in the 90s, Brazil adopted the TRIPS Agreement Compliant Legislation. So Brazil was very 
early, very uh, fast in doing this compliance with the TRIPS agreement. So basically, we had our copyright legislation enacted in 1998, and our intellectual property and patents and trademarks legislation enacted in 1996. That was different, for instance, from India, which actually enjoyed to the most uh, extent possible the flexibilities that TRIPS provided. And actually, that had a very positive impact, for instance, in terms of creating a generics drug industry in India, something that Brazil is struggling to do still right now. So basically, we adopted the legislation in the 90s, but the question then became enforcement. So starting in 2000, the International Intellectual Property Alliance they started like petition the USTR in the United States to put Brazil under a, a, a general preference system review. So basically to pressure Brazil because of the absence of enforcement in spite of the fact that we, we had like pretty severe legislation in the country. So basically in 2001, actually the USTR granted IIPA's request and Brazil was actually uh, included as part as, as the priority watch list, uh, that meaning that Brazil was considered a country that was not taking adequate measures for protecting intellectual property. So that created a vast political impact over the Brazilian government. Basically, everyone at the government was very worried and started to mobilize in order to take action regarding enforcement. And one of the first things that happened was actually that new legislation was adopted. So the Brazilian law was changed in order to make copyright infringement, uh, commercial copyright infringement, to be enforced without uh, being a, a private case. It started to become a public enforcement issue. And actually, anyone from the police or the public prosecutors could actually have the power to prosecute against copyright infringement. So that was a big change for the Brazilian legislation, and it became much easier for the government to start to become involved with enforcement. So in 2004, actually Brazil created uh, a new forum that was called CNCP, the National Council for Fighting Piracy, and that forum was created inside the federal government by the Minister of Justice. So just to make sure this is the Minister of Justice in Brazil at the time. And then uh, this forum was created, something that is pretty much unprecedented in any other country. So basically this is a federal body with a very comprehensive articulation between different players. So basically you see that you have members of several different uh, organizations from the Chamber of Deputies, the Senate, to ministers like justice, culture, foreign affairs, and all the different police divisions in Brazil are also involved. And basically, all the private sector uh, interest groups, they have a seat at this particular body, the CNCP. One of the criticism it actually receives is that no one from the public society or the civil society actually have a place there. It's only the industry with a direct channel with the government, and that's how the CNCP works. So basically that started in 2004. As a consequence, there started to be a very high level of coordination between the law enforcement agencies, and basically the number of raids and seizures, they increased significantly, and still today, year after year, Brazil actually uh, has a new record of seizures and also of online takedowns of websites. So basically enforcement was not only uh, physical world rates, but also online enforcement that started to, to take place. And every year these numbers are higher and higher starting from 2004. So basically another interesting thing is that December 3rd was created as the national day for combating piracy. It's not a holiday yet, but uh, it's a day that the federal government proclaimed as a, a, an important date to celebrate or something like that.
So basically, what happened after that? Well, certainly the actions that have been taken by the Brazilian government, which are extremely high, especially when you compare those with other countries. Brazil took the fight against piracy very seriously, and it has become recognized for those actions. So you see at the special 301 report that was issued by the, the USTR this year, that the enforcement actions in Brazil are actually being praised by USTR. However, actually, it seems that the report is not entirely happy with uh, the Brazilian actions, and they actually say, and they create like new levels of enforcement that they want to, to establish. So basically, they are worried about book piracy right now, and that means students copying a book to study in a university, for instance, and they are also worried about piracy over the internet. About the second issue, I think it's important to mention that Google has released uh, a transparency report in which Brazil was put in the number one place as countries which issue takedown requests. So basically, right now, Brazil is the number one country in the world that issues uh, both data retention and also content removal requests. So basically, that indicates that Brazil is on top even of like a more authoritarian uh, government. And it's a very intensive action that is being taken on the part of the judiciary in Brazil in order to take down content. And most part of it is actually related to piracy. So actually, there is a lot of action going on in spite of the complaints of the USTR about this. So basically, it's also important to mention that the level of demands are increasing more and more. So basically, the whack-a-mole game that Joe described it's also taking place in terms of what Brazil could do to fight against piracy. So basically, after dedicating an entire decade to enforcement, now the level of details of demands, they get really uh, specific. So for instance, one of the complaints uh, from the IIPA this year was actually to revoke a university ruling that was adopted by the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. So basically, they say that this particular ruling allows for students to make copies of books to study. And they want that revoked as part of the international pressure over the country. So to my surprise, the level has become really and really detailed to the point that a private uh, ruling, like a specific ruling from one university, is actually being taken to the international sphere in order to put pressure in Brazil for in further enforcement. So that's the current situation right now. So basically, a lot of issues actually come up out of this. The first one is that these increasing demands actually overburden the local institutions. The Brazilian prisons, they are completely crowded. The judiciary system cannot deal with the amount of the demands it has right now. So basically, the system is increasingly being demand more and more. And of course, that leads to an exhaustion of government resources. So basically, the Brazilian government has invested a lot of money so far. And basically, there is a request to invest even more uh, in order to, to provide enforcement measures. And also, uh, the important thing is that there is inadequate prices and access barriers that are not taken into account. So basically, Joe described the problem with prices in Brazil, how much expensive a DVD costs, especially compared to the revenue uh, per capita uh, levels in the country. So this discussion about prices it doesn't take place. And actually, uh, no action or debate on business models are taking place in Brazil. And only enforcement and education actually prevails. So basically, if you consider the three uh, mandates that the CMCP, that particular organization that I mentioned, has, only two of their mandates, which are repressive measures and educational measures, are actually being fulfilled. The third uh, issue, which is discussing and implementing economic measures, that has not taken place at all. 
So basically, when we interviewed people for our study, one of the consultants that we interviewed actually said that uh, the music companies, the recording companies, and the cinema and video companies, they can't talk about pricing. They say, uh, we are not going to talk about pricing, and you can't talk about pricing, and that's it. And this Luis Paulo that you see is actually the head of the CNCP. So basically, he is the government officer being told by the industry that the industry is not going to talk about price, and that's it. Uh, so basically, the second line of action that is taking place in Brazil is about educational measures. And in this sense, what's going on a lot is pretty much the problem of the industry numbers. And we actually spent quite a long time analyzing the numbers that are actually published in Brazil about infringement. And one number that if you go on Google, you will see multiple references, is actually that 19 billion in taxes are not collected every year because of piracy. And also that piracy costs 2 million jobs per year. This is the type of information you read all over the press in Brazil. You also read it online everywhere. And basically, we research those numbers. We try to find their sources. And they are credited to one university in Brazil that is called the University of Campinas. And we talked with that particular... <laughs> may have to have a looks like uh, we'll have to end that or try to get them back um, I suggest that for now we can actually move to our, our third speaker and I, I think we'll we might be able to get back to Ronaldo these are the things that happen with uh, with technology with Skype now that Microsoft owns it oops I didn't say that um, <laughs> So, uh, next we have, of course, the, the, the view from Canada. What does this mean for us? What, what is going on uh, in the Canadian context? And we're quite fortunate to have with us somebody that, that some people have called um, the Lawrence Lessig of Canada, but I myself like to say that Lawrence Lessig is the Michael Geist of the U.S. Um, Michael Geist is, of course, the, the, the a law professor at the University of Ottawa, and he's the Canada Research Chair in Internet and E-Commerce Law. You've probably already read his regular com uh, column in the Ottawa Citizen and the Toronto Star. Uh, he was also the editor of the recently published From Radical Extremism to Balance Copyright, Canadian Copyright, and the Digital Agenda. And in 2010, he was also uh, named one of the 50 most influential people on intellectual property in the world. So, Michael, over to you, and I'll help get your presentation on. Cool. Okay. Great. Well, thanks very much, and, and thanks for the invitation. And, and let me add... Uh, my congratulations to, to Joe for what is a, a remarkable report and a remarkably important report. Uh, if it's one that you haven't had a chance to read, I'm sure your appetite has been whetted by his presentation. Uh, but in a, an environment where for a very long time we've largely been dealing with fictions rather than fact, uh, the, the ability to undertake that, this kind of work and try to, to layer in some real fact uh, is, I think, enormously important. And I think it's also enormously important to recognize that this would not have happened but for IDRC. So I'm, I'm thankful certainly for the invitation, but I'm particularly thankful that they funded work that uh, not everybody is quite candidly willing to fund. I sit on uh, one of the boards, the Open Society Institute's program boards, um, where we focus on some of these same kinds of issues and the pressures that are sometimes brought to bear to fund what is incredibly important uh, work is sometimes difficult uh, to, to go through, and yet uh, IDRC has, has, has at the center of all of this by funding this. So it's been a terrific contribution. So as, as you heard, I want to talk a bit about Canada. And uh, in some respects, it seems to me that the, the, some of the lessons that we heard about are lessons that a Canadian might sit back and say, well, this sounds incredibly familiar. Uh, the notion that piracy is more about a market failure as opposed to a legal one is one that I think resonates in many respects 
here as well. There are clearly differences, but it's certainly one that resonates. And, and one can well understand why. I did a, a column that tried to talk a bit about this, but in an environment when many Canadians are used to seeing screens like this, when they try to access sites like Hulu.com or various other services that aren't available in Canada, this notion that Canadians who might look elsewhere, look elsewhere because the services aren't otherwise available. It's less about price, I suppose, and more about mere availability and servicing the market, the absence of uh, illicit market or illicit service, in a sense, is one that resonates with a lot of people. And I think that we have also experienced very recently what happens when someone tries to enter the marketplace and truly serve them. So the other screen that a lot of Canadians have become familiar with in the last year is this one with Netflix, which in the span of less than a year is now approaching a million subscribers, offering up access for $8 a month for an unlimited amount of content. We, uh, there was one report out this week that suggested that Netflix now accounts for 13% of Canadian internet traffic. Uh, that sounds like an exaggeration, but nevertheless, it's clear that this has become an enormously popular service, one that for many users has replaced what might be seen as illicit services, trying to access some of the same kind of content via download services, BitTorrent, and the like. And it's worked because it works well, and it's priced well, and it's, uh, it's emblematic in a sense of servicing the marketplace in a way that will allow people to say, yes, I'd like that alternative. And of course, people have seen all of this. Jesse Brown, for example, did a piece fairly recently in Toronto Life uh, talking about honor among thieves, and it became quite controversial in which he said, listen, yes, I download. I download movies, I download television shows, and the like, and I do it because Hollywood or the other various industries won't sell to me. So Netflix is, is an example of how, in fact, uh, there is some shift that's taking place and that we in, in Canada have experienced some of the same sorts of things, not in terms of the pricing, but in terms of actually servicing the, the market. But what I want to spend the, the few minutes that I have talking about is to caution against taking everything that we see in this report and saying it applies here in Canada at the same time. Because I think that lesson of the need to provide uh, market alternatives and to respond to market demands is clearly there. But as they would say in, on the tube uh, in London, we need to mind the gap. There are differences between Canada and some of the other markets that are looked at in this study. And I think we have to exercise some caution in suggesting that, well, take a look at the report, it's the same sort of thing. Because the same kind of comments that come up around those marketplaces, around weak laws or weak enforcement, about being a piracy haven, uh, are the same sorts of comments that are often made about Canada. And while some might say, well, it's all the same, I want to try to make the case to you that it's simply not, that these are in the same way that we saw some fictions uh, dissolve under, this, the, under the research of this particular study, the fictions about weak laws in Canada or Canada being a piracy haven are just that. They are fictions. Uh, and attempts to try to take this sort of study and say, see, it's just the same in Canada simply aren't true. So let's go through some of those and start with this notion of weak laws. And you've already heard about it now uh, from all three speakers, the USTR Special 301 report, this annual report that comes from the United States where they put on, put on their list of those that are seen to be, uh, have inefficient or ineffective uh, intellectual property laws, particularly on copyright, though not exclusively so. Canada is on that list. We've been on that list for a very long time. I would argue that we are in good company. If you take a look at the list right now, there are 4.4 billion people uh, is the population of the various countries that are listed on the most recent USTR Special 301 report, and they exclude most of Africa from within that report. And so what we are really talking about is the United States effectively claiming that almost everybody on this planet, with the exception of its own citizens and the citizens of a few other select countries, live under what they view as substandard intellectual property laws. And so the notion that somehow we ought to be embarrassed by being on this report is simply untrue. We are, as I say, in good company. You can see 13 of the top 20 countries by GDP are all on this list. The U.S. has a bone to pick with almost everyone, uh, including us. Now, the good news is, and you heard Ronaldo talk about the response in Brazil, which was to enact a whole new uh, police force, in a sense, and ramp up the enforcement when they were placed on the list. The response from Canadian officials, at least, at least behind the scenes, if not necessarily the politicians who have, a, have to be a bit more um, quiet, I guess, in terms of their response, is that by and large Canadian officials see the USTR Special 301 report for what it is. 
Uh, and so this was a comment that was made at a, at, a, at a hearing before the House of Commons, but we've seen it repeated now in a number of occasions. With regard to the watch list, Canada does not recognize the 301 list process. It basically lacks reliable uh, and objective analysis. It's driven entirely by U.S. industry. Canada has raised that repeatedly with U.S. officials, but of course it hasn't stopped U.S. officials from repeatedly putting Canada on the list. And so in a sense it's a bit of a game. The U.S. puts us on the list. Um, that you get a few uh, journalists who might run stories on this saying, hey, we're, we're a bad guy on this list yet again. The reality, I think, you know, quite encouragingly, is that from a Canadian perspective, uh, there is broad recognition, I think, within the government that this is nothing more um, than what is amped up pressure from various industry groups and doesn't truly reflect uh, any sort of reasonable analysis of the sort that, that Joe has undertaken with respect to what really takes place. When others take a look at the situation in Canada, they do identify the fact that we have nothing uh, to be ashamed about in terms of our ranking relative to other countries. Um, last year, the World Economic Forum placed us third amongst the G8 country, amongst these, these various G8 countries, and Canada is compliant with all of its uh, international treaty obligations right now. There's claims how we are substandard in a number of ways. Uh, there are certainly treaties that we have yet to implement, uh, but the ones that we have si signed on for and the ones that we are required to meet are ones that we are compliant with. In fact, uh, and it's good Howard Knopf is in the, in the room and he's written quite extensively on this, there are many areas uh, where Canadian law is in fact stronger than, let's say, U.S. law. And we could come up with a very long list, in fact, of instances where Can Canadians pay more, whether through royalty systems or levies, some refer to them as taxes, whether it's restrictions on the sorts of things that Canadians can undertake, whether in the education system, fair dealing, creative, sor uh, creative activities, whether we're talking about parody and satire. These are all sorts of things that within the current Canadian framework uh, are more restrictive or sometimes involve greater payments than what you find in other jurisdictions, most notably the United States. Now, I don't list this as a good thing. Uh, I think there are many things that Canada would actually do well to emulate what we've seen take place in the United States. But it at a minimum needs to be said that claims that somehow Canada is substandard and weak don't stand up to any sort of real scrutiny. I think we also have to counter the regular claims that somehow Canada is a pi so-called piracy haven. Uh, there's no doubt that infringement takes place here as it does uh, in the United States and as it does in the various countries that were examined uh, as part of this study. But there is nothing to suggest from the data that is out there, uh, even some data that itself sometimes is called into question, that there's anything particularly notable about Canada as a source or a haven for piracy. Uh, Joe mentioned that we ought to uh, park business software to the side, but if we're going to bring it into the conversation for just a bit, the most recent report out just a few weeks ago noted that Canada's piracy rate as measured by the Business Software Alliance, the BSA, is at an all-time low. In fact, we've been dropping faster than almost any other, any other uh, developed country in the world. Um, now, there are lots of methodologi methodological questions about this particular study, but there is little doubt that from at least a trend perspective, the numbers that they've spit out year after year after year show a continual decline. Uh, one in which we have lower rates, according to the BSA, than many countries that don't find themselves on the USTR Special 301 list. I'd also note that, for example, just this past week, the Entertainment Software Association of Canada released a big report talking about just how important and successful uh, entertainment software has become in Canada. Canada is now the number three country worldwide uh, for entertainment software. And on a per capita basis, we are number one. What's striking about the report is that the very success stories were asked uh, what their primary risks in the Canadian market are. Uh, these are the top six. Copyright and piracy is not among them. Uh, and so when you actually talk to those that are engaged in this area and have been uh, seen enormous amount of success, copyright and piracy eventually does appear if we were to go further down, but there are all sorts of issues that they identify as their primary business risks. It's not about copyright and piracy. We can talk about the Motion Picture Association as well. There was once talk that Canada was a haven for so-called camcording, people going into theaters uh, and, take, and filming these and then putting them up on the internet. In fact, Canada changed its laws with respect to camcording. We had laws that made it an act of infringement. 
Uh, Hollywood wanted tougher laws. They got tougher laws. Uh, and in fact, the Hollywood studios have themselves acknowledged that Canada now has virtually disappeared as a source of camcorded films, whether that's a result of the law or not, uh, is open to conjecture. But uh, the reality is that we are certainly not a haven for this sort of activity, according to the industry itself. What we do face in sort of the Hulu-type situation is an environment where there are businesses that haven't entered, not because of the state of Canadian copyright law in terms of not being tough enough, but because of licensing restrictions or challenges that, uh, that are faced in the marketplace. And to take one example, Pandora, a very popular online music service that was at, at one time available in Canada and no longer is. The, the head of Pandora, they actually just filed for IPO yesterday, says that it's important for Canadian listeners to understand that Pandora actually wants to enter into the marketplace. Uh, it's not as if it's scared off by the Canadian market in terms of what our laws look like or the allegations of piracy. It wants to come. It's found that the licensing price is being demanded by uh, the various music interests, whether it's the studios or other rights holders, are so high that they can't make an economic case. So pricing does enter into the marketplace here. It comes in at such a high price that we've got would-be entrants into the marketplace who say, I'm not, I can't enter, enter into your marketplace when you're going to price at that sort of level. It's not about the sorts of legal protections that you have in place. That ties into this notion of market failures, claims that somehow Canada is a piracy haven and that we've had continue, uh, high levels of market failures. It's a, it's a failed market, a wild west we sometimes hear from various groups. Um, look at the numbers. This is the recording industry in numbers 2011. It came out just uh, a month and a half ago. It's sort of seen as the Bible of the industry in terms of putting out various numbers in terms of where the industry stands. Uh, these are the top physical markets uh, ranked by sales. Uh, and then the top digital markets ranked by sales. So physical, of course, being CD. You can see Canada ranks uh, seventh. As a global market for physical, we rank sixth as a market for digital. Our ranking on the digi for digital sales is actually ahead of our physical sales on a global level. The notion that somehow Canadians don't buy uh, digital music online simply is untrue. In fact, if you dig further into the recording industry's numbers, we find that the percentage that digital sales comprise of the overall music market in Canada is higher than almost every other country around the world. Uh, the exceptions are the United States, which has seen a precipitous decline in its physical sales, so its digital sales have increased, as well as a number of other countries that really had no physical sales to speak of at all. Um, and so digital sales have come into a marketplace where there was almost no sales before, um, in Canada, we're ahead, as you can see, of Australia, the UK, Japan, New Zealand, and others in terms of a percentage. And this in an environment when many of these services came in later than they did, certainly than they did in the United States, and in some instances still have fewer. But as a percentage, Canadians are quite clearly buying. In fact, our digital music sales growth, the speed with which digital music sales have grown in Canada, uh, have grown faster for the last five consecutive years in Canada than they have in the, in the United States. So it started certainly from a lower starting point, in part because iTunes, uh, the predominant, obviously, uh, online music seller, started in the United States almost two years before it started in Canada, so there's a bit of catch-up. But if you take a look at the last five years, we've grown faster year after year after year after year. The Entertainment Software Association, I made reference to them a moment ago. They are another case in point, growing, as you can see, uh, for the last couple of years at 11 percent, expected growth rate at 17 percent, gone from what was the number four worldwide now, as I say, to number three, an enormously, enormous and enormously important success story, one that's happened under the current copyright framework. The notion that there's been a problem is simply untrue. And I want to just conclude with, with a brief reference, because I'm just incapable of not talking about copyright reform, um, and to, to note that the comparisons that exist between Canada and some of these other jurisdictions fall not just in the notion that somehow we're in a piracy haven but the, and that our laws are weak, uh, which, which where they simply don't stand scrutiny. But the one place where there is some similarities is in fiction-based claims about what legal changes will make as opposed to changes based on fact. And we saw that in Bill C-32, which I'll tell you uh, had many good points, I think, as a piece of legislation. It was not 
perfect by any means. There's some real problems uh, in that last bill. This was the last bill that the government introduced that died on the order paper and that had, it has promised uh, to bring back. In fact, the speech from the throne is on right now. I'm assuming somewhere in that speech from the throne they've said uh, that they will bring back the Copyright Modernization Act. So we know it's going to come back. Um, but Canada is quite clearly not immune from some of the fictional claims around some of these issues. For example, there was an attempt within the bill to differentiate between statutory damages of a commercial scale, which result in very large damages, where there's been commercial profit, as compared to instances of non-commercial infringement where there has been no attempt to profit. And in fact, I think everybody uh, would recognize that when we put statutory damages into effect, there was a recognition that it had no intent to apply to non-commercial cases. And so the bill proposed to put a cap at $5,000, not insignificant for many, yet, a yet according to the head of the Canadian Recording Industry Association, this would create a license to steal for Canadians, that they might view this $5,000 as nothing more than an insignificant fine and thus download as much as they saw fit and then just merely have to pay five grand if they were caught. We've had similar claims, you heard about the takedowns with respect to internet service providers around a notice and notice system that has worked very effectively in Canada where there are notifications sent, when there are allegations of infringement, at notices that actually protect the privacy of the individual because it's not provided to the rights holder. And according to Rogers at, the, at hearings just a number of months ago, they indicated that two-thirds of their subscribers who get these notifications stop the infringement within the first notification. Uh, and the numbers revolved, devolved down to less than 1% of the Rogers subscriber base within two notifications. And yet we continue to have claims that somehow this is an ineffective system. And of course, the other big fiction that we continue to tell ourselves and the primary problem with the bill is somehow if we just provide legal protection for digital locks, the locks that are found on CDs and DVDs uh, and the like, the very th various things that we saw in the big pile in the picture on the cover, of this report, they've all got digital locks on them and somehow there is this notion that if only we provide legal protection for digital locks that all of this sort of activity will disappear. Uh, the experience that we've seen, we don't need a large 400 page study to tell us that this is simply untrue. We only need to look at the experience in a number of jurisdictions, most notably the United States, where these laws have been in place since before the advent of Napster and quite clearly have had no impact uh, on what is said to be uh, large scale online copyright infringement. And so those are the kinds of fictions that we tell ourselves and uh, I think it's high time and this study I think goes a long way to ensuring that uh, as we move forward with our own policies both nationally and on a global level that we start prioritizing fiction over fact. Thanks very much for your attention. All right. So, oh good, we have Ronaldo back. So at least we can get him here for questions and, and comments from the audience. Um, so we would ask that anybody who's got a question or a comment would go up to the mic and uh, please, if you could state your name and any affiliation you might have. Um, and do we have anything from online? Okay, so I'll read the first question uh, online. How can we educate people in developing nations on the implications of participating knowingly or unknowingly in media piracy for the country's socioeconomic development? Uh, let's take a crack at that one. <laughs> All right. Go ahead. Is my mic on sufficiently yeah. so that yeah. can be heard? Okay. Uh, well, let me break that down. I mean, one, one thing we argue in the reports is that uh, most of the ways in which people have talked about the relationship between copyright and development hinge on a couple sort of idealistic economic models that don't hold up in practice. So one of the, you know, one of the rationales for strengthening enforcement has, ten has traditionally been that you need to have a strong enforcement environment in order to secure great, to, in order to increase foreign investment. And that, you know, that was a, an economic argument that really dominated the debate for 20 years, really, uh, from the time when, he, when some of these intellectual property arguments began to be advanced in the late 1970s. Um, and it reflected the, the, the role uh, that trade economists and, and uh, IP lawyers played in the debate. I mean, that was the debate. It was really a, a set of very narrow uh, academic specialties involved. Uh, then China came along. <laughs> 
And the thing China did was demonstrate that you could steal rampantly, copy everything systematically, and still be swamped with foreign investment. Right? So there was a huge empirical counterexample to this argument where the, the claims about the relationship between enforcement and, and foreign investment just got blown out of the water by the Chinese case. So nobody's really making those kinds of arguments anymore. And uh, you know, we've instead gone back to a much longer historical record that suggests that there's a, there's a very clear logic to both the strength of intellectual property laws and the enforcement of them with respect to development. And that is, if you're an IP importing country, you have an interest in uh, promulgating the, 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 the diffusion of knowledge, the diffusion of media goods, the diffusion of, of, of texts. Uh, for IP importing countries, they realize a consumer benefit or a, 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 a domestic benefit from low levels of IP protection and low levels of, I, uh, of IP enforcement. As countries become exporters, that relationship shifts, right? Because the domestic companies that have an interest in exporting begin to see an interest in uh, stronger enforcement abroad. So there's a, there's a fairly clear relationship. If you look historically over the last, well, you know, going back even as the, you know, the early days of print between importing countries and exporting countries, where it was almost always the exporting countries that were the most aggressive in, in, in making claims for stronger enforcement on other countries. The importing countries were almost always on the side of, you know, let as much information and knowledge, uh, text, movies, films, videos, whatever, uh, come into the country as possible. That's a consumer surplus if you're on the importing side of that relationship. So that, you know, that reverses the usual development argument that's made about intellectual property. Uh, whether you can educate people or not about that, well, that's, that's what we've written about. We hope, hopefully that's a, a basis for educating them. But um, I'll maybe let Michael answer this. If, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, just, I want to take a, a crack at it from a Canadian perspective. Uh, and note that I, I, I think you can make an argument that there are issues with respect to copyright education. In fact, the Captain Copyright that you saw on the slide was um, a Canadian product um, put together by Access Copyright. The, the problem, I think, from a Canadian education perspective is not about Canadians not knowing enough about what's infringing. Uh, it's about not knowing enough about r what rights they actually have. Uh, and so, so often today within education environments and in other environments, the, inst the instinct, in part fueled by 10 years, I would argue, of miseducation, uh, is, is all about the things you are unable to do. And this notion that, well, I don't have a license, I don't have appropriate permissions, in fact, there are areas where Canadian copyright law provides a fair amount of flexibility. It's there. Uh, we just need to have the courage to start using it. And what we need, in a sense, is, and we started to see it, the CAUT, the Canadian Association of University Teachers, for example, just put out what I thought was an invaluable uh, set of guidelines that try to help teachers to better understand not all the things they can't do, but all the things that they can. Uh, and part of uh, copyright education, I think, has to start focusing a little more on the sorts of things the law already gives us the right to do. Uh, hi, I'm Howard, Howard Knopf, uh, who Michael uh, kindly referred to a few minutes ago, lawyer here in Ottawa. I've got a, a two-part uh, question and maybe to put follow up something Michael just said. It's, it's the same topic, really, but I, maybe Joe can take the first part of it and Michael the second. And it has to do with rational behavior on the part of content owners. Joe, you said you thought that the, that the content owners, particularly the, the, the movie people, I think you said, were, were being rational actors in the way they price internationally. But I wonder about that. They have tools available to them in the form of regional coding and uh, use of selective clever use of languages uh, that they might be able to use. I mean, one of, their fa one of the few things they say that really actually makes some sense about all of this is that they're afraid that if they put, you know, a DVD on the market for a retail price of three or four dollars abroad, that is, there's going to be boatloads of them shipped back into the United States and Europe uh, through arbitrage and gray marketing. Now, leaving aside the fact that there are remedies against that, uh, in a legal sense, there's, there's also technological language remedies. I mean, China, South America, these are all regional coded place. DVDs that are made with those codings won't work in the United States and Europe. And if the, if the DVD is released only in Portuguese and Spanish in South America or only in 
Chinese in China, whatever, it's of no interest to almost anybody in the United States or Canada or Europe because they won't be able to understand it. So I'm wondering why they don't, if they're rational actors, why they don't make more use of that. And, and uh, the second part of rationality is to Michael, who mentioned the very interesting example of Pandora. I wonder if that's not, uh, Pandora is, I think, being rational because they can't economically operate in Canada, but is that an example of the tragedy of the anti-commons? Uh, we, we're, we're, we actually have too much intellectual property protection, and we have this thing called the Copyright Board, which sets several, several tariffs that add on cumulatively layered upon layered on top of each other with the result that Pandora might have to spend millions of dollars, literally, because that's now the going rate at the Copyright Board uh, to deal with all of this and still end up paying an enormously high amount of money. Um, uh, and why would they do that? I mean, Canada's the size of Texas or California. Would they spend millions of dollars in legal fees or whatever to enter the Texas or California market at a higher price than the rest of the United States? Of course not. And, uh, and the third part, this is the third thing was more of a comment than a question is education, and you made a very good point. Um, are ed institutions that should be pu pushing for education of what you can do, users' rights, several of them, all of them in some ways and several of them in many ways are simply failing at that. But anyway, that, that's my, 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 my question. But the, the, the rationality, that's my comment. The rationality thing is a genuine question on both of them. Uh, I guess I'll start. Uh, well, I mean, as you said, I, mean, I think, sorry? Uh, you know, spe uh, from the DVD on, um, the studios have made an effort to, to use technologies to sort of segment the market. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I think that the, the digital piracy moment has just circumvented that to a point where the question of parallel importation is just irrelevant. Right? It doesn't matter if people are shipping or transshipping or smuggling DVDs at this point. I mean, that's, just a, that's just a trivial component of this. And I would much rather see a border control problem than a decision to, to leave the Brazilian market or the, Indi or the Indian market or the Russian market completely underdeveloped out of fear of parallel importation. So I guess that's the, I mean, you have to pick your problems. I would rather have a border control problem for a good that's increasingly irrelevant than hundreds of millions of underserved customers turning to pirated goods because there's no legal market for, for the goods that they're being exposed to through advertising and through other kinds of global cultural practices. I'm not sure that's an answer to your question, but it's, a, it's an elaboration. Well, on no, it. no, it's, it's good. I mean, the, the mo, the, it may now be a moot question, if that's, if that's what your answer is. I, that's probably right. But at one time, I think they could have done all of that and maybe avoided a lot of the digital piracy. On, on this issue of uh, the licensing issues, uh, I agree that it's a problem. I don't think it's a problem. It's exclusively exclusive to Canada, though. I mean, I look at the Hargraves report that points to in the U a new recent report out of the UK that points to some of the challenges in getting uh, streamlining licenses. We're actually over lunch talking about the challenges of launching uh, a Netflix-like service uh, in Europe, and you find you've got, you're dealing with 27 different jurisdictions um, with 27 different licenses. It makes it almost impossible to be able to launch similar kinds of services. The complexity in Canada is sometimes you're paying what feels like double or triple payment uh, for basically the same sort of thing, where you've got a number of different rights holders one who wants it wants wants to be paid for the reproduction. One who wants to be paid for the performance. Uh, it feels like roughly the same sort of thing, and yet um, copyright board steps in and says everybody's entitled to their payment. And what you're ultimately left with, as you say, are people just who are unable to economically enter into the marketplace. And it seems to me that we're all the poorer for it. The, from a consumer perspective, we get fewer services than you might have in other jurisdictions. From a creator artist perspective. Uh, they're basically making a choice of taking nothing as opposed to uh, taking something. And you know, if you take a look at the experience in the United States, a number of even the collectives that uh, have moved into the internet streaming space have begun to d collect a uh, significant amount of funds. We're talking about tens of millions of dollars on an annual basis. In many instances, nothing is being collected in Canada, um, in part because of we've priced ourselves out of an economically viable entry point. Ronaldo, would you like to take a crack at this? Sure, v very quickly. Uh, the first thing is about education. 
Uh, in Brazil, there was this experience with primary and secondary school students that took place in the state of Sao Paulo. And basically, uh, there was a, like a school curriculum about piracy and fighting against piracy. And when we reviewed the materials, it was a very problematic material because it was basically teaching people to students that were not really accurate. For instance, the numbers of piracy and like what was the impact on the economy and like even things about fair use rights that were not actually true. So basically, this uh, effort, it, it, a part of not working, not producing a real impact over the reduction of piracy, it actually had a, a very difficult situation because it really interfered with the school curriculums in Brazil. So basically, when we reviewed the materials, we were actually surprised by the amount of inaccuracies that were actually being taught to primary and secondary school students. About the licensing issue, I think it's important to remember that like a, the majority of countries, including Brazil, we don't have iTunes, we don't have Hulu, we don't have Netflix, Pandora, Spotify, or anything like that. And actually, the only digital music stores that we have actually sell one track for basically two dollars which is more expensive than the amount that is actually charged in the United States. So basically, it's no wonder that there is not a lot of people actually buying digital music in Brazil. And one of the primary reasons for that is certainly the fact that it's being sold for $2 a track, which is like a, a price that is completely incompatible with the, the level of revenue in the country. That's it. Uh, hi, my name is Jeff. I'm a graduate student at the University of Ottawa. I have two questions for Joe. They're both actually about personalized music streaming services like Pandora, Spotify. Uh, in your presentation, you touched upon uh, Spotify changing um, pricing structures. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that? And also, do you really see uh, Spotify, Pandora, and others uh, being viable options for people uh, whose demands are otherwise unmet? And the reason I ask that is because a lot of the home turfs of these companies uh, have highly developed digital markets. So do you see them as really being a, um, a strong player in, uh, in the countries that you've studied in the future? Well, I'll, I'll qualify my response and say that I'm not an expert on uh, emerging digital business models. Uh, the prospects of Spotify to gain a foothold in, in you know, outside the UK market, or even within it at this point, I think is, uh, uh, you know, I'm just, I, I just can't comment in an informed way on that. I do think that, uh, you know, the larger trend we're seeing is toward subscription-based, uh, low-cost, all-you-can-eat services, and that if the good is priced low enough and is convenient enough and is available in, you know, most of the ways people want it to be available, which is available on multiple devices, shareable within uh, small social networks, at least. Uh, you know, there, there, there are a variety of, you know, to, to a considerable extent, piracy has set consumer expectations around much faster availability for goods, much lower cost for goods, and much, much more convenience in terms of how the how the the good can circulate or, or be be moved from device to device. So, you know, we're in an era in which the the legal services have to compete with the pirate services, both in terms of cost and convenience. And that's, I think, just not going to change. That's, that's you know, Spotify may be good enough to, to meet that threshold. And, it's, and I, I don't think the emergence of these services will kill piracy or eliminate piracy in any sense, but I think they can, you know, the, the, the new market is going to be one where the legal services are competing at a much lower cost or price point and providing, at the very least, comparable and hopefully better levels of service than, than uh, you know the peer-to-peer -peer networks or the or the the, you know, the 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 file lockers and and it's you know that probably is going to mean a a, a a set of businesses with in which there's less money in distribution right that that seems unavoidable to me so that's what makes it so painful for the current incumbents who built up their business models on uh, you know in, mar in markets in which they could extract a lot of money from distribution. Uh, the new, you know, the, the the new environment just isn't going to. If, if, in insofar as there's competition in the market, those kinds of margins are going to get eaten away. And I do think there is a lower a lower equilibrium between the pirate market 
and a very flexible, low-cost legal market that will prove to be sustainable in the sense of providing enough revenues going back to creators to incentivize cultural production uh, and you know, make piracy effectively irrelevant. Right? That's, I think that's the most we can hope for, that the piracy just becomes irrelevant uh, and therefore just sort of cuts out the question of real, you know, the more, these punitive enforcement proposals. Right? Why go after people uh, and, and threaten what, are, you know, what is increasingly recognized as a basic, you know, basic means of uh, exercising their rights? So this, this, you know, we were talking earlier too about the, the, the way in which the access to the internet is increasingly being defined as a right, as an enabler of your ability to exercise uh, rights to freedom of expression, rights to socio and socio and economic participation. Uh, you know, the enforcement. If, if, if this, if, if the market evolves in the way that that we're pointing toward, that conversation about threatening those kinds of basic rights for the sake of copyright rights, for the sake of the rights holders, uh, is just it just falls out of the equation. Hopefully. So that's you know that's where, that, that's my hope for Spotify and Hulu and Netflix. I don't have any uh, predictions on whether any well, any single version of these business models can be more or less successful than the others. But I think you know if if, if we're not uh, you know sticking a wrench in the process by creating a you know a sort of copyright surveillance regime that uh, that begins to intrude on everything people are doing online, that's where the businesses are are, are going to end up. Is that an answer? Yeah, that's an answer. I actually have a okay. bonus question. You're not going to kick me off. Um, you mentioned, because you didn't have enough time, but you mentioned the benefits of piracy. Could you uh, just talk a little bit about that? Sure. Well, any time there's a loss, there's a benefit, right? So if, it's, if somebody's losing money, somebody is notionally gaining money. So if you're talking about a $50 billion loss to the software companies, you could equally talk about a $50 billion gain on the other end, on the other end of that um, equation. So that's you know, one of the perspectives we've brought to bear on, on looking at the impact of piracy in developing countries. So a $50 billion subsidy for the software infrastructure for the developing world is actually a very significant contribution to social welfare. Uh, we don't really see it in those terms. Uh, I mean, we, there's, we don't see it exclusively in those terms because we think that the notion of losses is so uh, complicated when you start looking at software. But throughout, I mean, the, the, the only study that's really tried to, to measure that effect. So again, if you're, if you're not spending money, if, you, if, if you're getting your money, if you're getting your music through uh, illicit channels of one kind or another, uh, that's money that you, and, and the, what, the, what, the record, what the record companies would call a loss is, is for you a savings, right? That money doesn't disappear from the economy. It gets spent in other ways. It gets spent on other kinds of consumption goods or groceries or rent or whatever. So it's not lost to the economy. Uh, and if you're an IP importing country and those, uh, those, those gains are greater than the losses going out, if you're, if, 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 uh, you know, basically if you're any country other than the US, you're, you're de facto an, an IP importing country. Uh, then there's a real consumer surplus there, and that consumer surplus can be measured. There's one study that we're aware of that, that has tried to measure it. It's a Dutch study of, of music file sharing in which they calculated that in the Netherlands, in a, in a country of 7 million, uh, on music alone, they determined that the, the net consumer benefit was 100 million euros. So if you were to try and scale that up and extend it to countries where the price to income ratios are much higher, you could be looking at much larger effects. Now they also qualify that in lots of ways. This is really loose economics, but you know, for the most part, this question of the benefit has been completely excluded from the conversation. And yet, you have to be looking at it. If you're really taking these questions seriously, you have to be looking at it because it, it, it explains so much about why the practices persist and why governments aren't, uh, you know, redirecting all their policing resources to these things. There are clear benefits. And in fact, instead, the question gets kind of sublimated or ignored or treated as a dirty secret. Or so, you know, we're trying to excavate that to some extent without celebrating it, but just to acknowledge it at the very least. Right. So the last, the last question from online um, from a certain David Crockett. I'm sure that's his real name. Um, <laughs> Doesn't international pressure from Western media companies put a disproportionate strain 
on foreign legal systems uh, to the point that it is endangering local populations who cannot prosecute more dangerous activities. Now, Joe, you, you talked a little bit about in your presentation on that issue. I don't know if you want to field that. Sure. I mean, I, I, in my view, I won't say our view. I think there are a lot of a lot of these points are really not things on which there is a perspective from the report. But uh, you know, if I, if I just sort of put those quotation marks around it, my view is that uh, there's no basis for having a separate legal system for IP. IP IP cases should be treated the same way as other cases are treated and be ordered in the you know, in the priority of uh, of uh, you know, how Judges, judges should be accorded the same kinds of uh, discretion to prioritize IP cases over other kinds of cases or behind them. Uh, uh, it's, it should be part of the same legal system. And part of, the, part of the pressure we see, part of the pressure that the USTR often puts on other countries is to develop special IP courts or, or special police units, uh, to develop, you know, essentially develop a, a, uh, a separate legal system for prosecuting IP cases. And that's something that, that in our view, is, is, is bad policy at, at many levels. It shouldn't be treated as a separate, uh, it shouldn't have its own legal system attached to it. Um, I'll drop, I'll leave it at that, I think. Ronaldo, had, did you have anything you wanted to add on that? I agree with the, the, this idea because, like, watching what happened in Brazil in the past 10 years, that is certainly true. And whenever the, the Brazilian grades uh, at the special 301 report are actually threatened to be raised, like a, that meaning Brazil is threatened to be considered like a more pirate country, that creates a lot of internal pressure inside the country. Just to give you an example, we are undergoing a copyright reform process. The Brazilian law was actually considered the fourth most restrictive legislation in the world by Consumers International. So basically, we don't have fair use rights in Brazil, like to be very blunt about the issue. And what is going on is that for the past five years, we were discussing a new legislation through a public process in which we had like more than 80 meetings and an online platform that received basically more than 7,000 comments. And we had a change in our minister of culture. So basically, our new minister, uh, whose name is Anna Jolanda, she decided to call off the reform and to start it over again. So she's very much committed uh, to these pressures. Actually, when President Obama went to Brazil, uh, she had a meeting with uh, the US officers in order to discuss the Brazilian copyright reform. And basically, we are right now at the risk of losing all the work that was done in the past five years because of pressures that the Brazilian copyright law should at least remain as it is, if not become more restrictive, adopting, for instance, three strike models or intermediary liability and so on. So definitely there is a strong pressure going on and it's being listened to. So basically whenever this pressure arises, it's actually causing action to be taken also uh, from the ground level in Brazil and other countries. Well, uh, please join me in thanking our three guests. I want to thank you all for being here as well. It was a beautiful sunny day outside, so it, it's uh, especially thrilling that you took the time for this. Um, just to remind you that the, the, the webcast will be online on IDRC's site, so you can uh, get some of this information again. Uh, the media piracy study is also online on uh, the Social Science Research Council site. Yep. Piracy.ssrc.org. Piracy so thank you again.